Uh, before I get started, I want to say thanks myself to uh, Aspen Writers Foundation and Winter Words for having me. I am delighted to be here. Um, it's an amazing set of people that you have coming in this season. Um, and it was, a, it was a particular point of anguish that I was going to miss Jared Diamond last week, <laughs> knowing that I was just days away from being here. Um, and, uh, of course, it's a delight to be here because I was at Summer Words in 2005. Um, and a number of things happened at that, uh, that summer that uh, led directly or indirectly to the publication of this book. So um, I owe a lot to this place, and um, I'm happy to be back. Uh, I just want to call out Natalie and Belisa for everything that they've done, and also Julie Pickerel for being such a help with our visit. Um, I guess I'd also say, uh, to put things in perspective, since we've already uh, gushed about Wisconsin a little bit, uh, I might be from Wisconsin, but Edgar Sautel is a Colorado native. Uh, he was conceived, born, raised, went to high school, college, and then we kicked him out of the house all here uh, in Colorado. So here's what I want to do tonight. This is, uh, what I'm going to cover is a kind of, uh, oh, can we have the lights up a little bit? Because I can't, I, I can't see my notes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I've cannibalized and mashed up about three different talks uh, for tonight, because I want to cover a, a number of different things. I understand that there are probably some writers in the audience, as well as readers. Um, and so uh, uh, at the, possibly at the expense of coherence, uh, I'm going to jump around and talk about a couple of different things. Obviously, uh, a little bit about the story of Edgar Sautel. Uh, but I also want to situate those comments in the context of some observations about the novel as a story form, why I find it fascinating and mysterious and frustrating, uh, both as a reader and a writer, and also why it can be so difficult, sometimes at least, to answer the very simple question of what a novel is about. I also want to give you a little backstory on uh, the research that went into this novel and some of the historical precedent for some of the dog-related aspects of this book. So, uh, but before I get all analytical about things, I want to read a passage from the book. For those of you who have not read the book or for those of you who it's been a while, um, let me give you a thumbnail sketch. The setting is a small farm in the north woods of Wisconsin where the Sawtell family raises and trains an entirely fictional breed of dog known only as Sawtell dogs. The culmination of 50 years of breeding, training, and selection for a kind of brilliance in companionship, although the exact nature of that brilliance is as underspecified as the physical descriptions of the dogs themselves. Over the course of three generations, the Sawtells have elevated their work to an art, and Edgar, an only child, is a kind of prodigy in that world. However, his somewhat unusual gifts derive from an equally unusual deficit. He is mute, but not deaf, and he must communicate with those closest to him in a partially invented language of sign. Aha, uh -huh. there we go, okay. The main action of the story takes place in 1972, when Edgar is 14 years old. A number of things happen that summer, but the chapter I'm going to read from first occurs uh, early in the novel, uh, and in fact, it tells the story of Edgar's birth in 1958 through the eyes of Almondine, this yearling dog, at that point, at least in the story, who, as the novel progresses, will be Edgar's nursemaid, friend, protector, and companion. You're going to hear uh, references in this chapter to Edgar's parents, Trudy and Gar, the family veterinarian, Paige Papineau, and also an old barn of gigantic proportions, which is practically a character of its own in this book, and which was converted to a kennel long ago by Edgar's grandfather. Finally, you should know that in the chapter leading up to this, Trudy and Gar have been trying to have a baby for quite some time. And the year before, a miscarriage took place uh, that left Trudy devastated. 
and Trudy and Dara are afraid that it could happen again. Almondine, however, has other concerns. And, uh, and the name of this chapter is simply Almondine. Eventually, she understood the house was keeping a secret from her. All that winter and all through the spring, Almondine had known something was going to happen, but no matter where she looked, she couldn't find it. Sometimes when she entered a room, there was the feeling that the thing that was going to happen had just been there. And she would stop and pant and peer around while the feeling seeped away as mysteriously as it had arrived. Weeks might pass without a sign. And then a night would come when lying nose to tail beneath the window in the kitchen corner, listening to the murmur of conversation and the slosh and clink of dishes being washed, she felt it in the house again. And she whisked her tail across the baseboards in long, pensive strokes and silently collected her feet beneath her and waited. When half an hour passed and nothing appeared, she groaned and sighed and rolled onto her back and waited to see if it was somewhere in her sleep. She began investigating unlikely crevices behind the refrigerator where age-old layers of dust whirled into frantic life under her breath. Within the tangle of chair legs and living feet beneath the kitchen table, inside the boots and shoes sagging in a line beside the back porch door, none with any success though freshly baited mouse traps began to appear behind the appliances, beyond the reach of her delicate, inquisitive nose. Once, when Edgar's parents left their closet door open, she'd spent an entire morning crouched on the bedroom floor, certain she'd finally cornered the thing among the jumble of shoes and drapes of cloth. She lost patience after a while and walked to the threshold, scenting the musty darkness. And she would have begun her search in earnest, but Trudy called from the yard and she was forced to leave it be. By the time she remembered the closet later that day, the thing was gone and there was no telling where it might have gotten to. Sometimes after she'd searched and failed to find the thing that was going to happen, she stood beside Edgar's mother or father and waited for them to call it out. But they'd forgotten about it or more likely, had never known in the first place. There were things like that. She learned obvious things they didn't know. The way they ran their hands down her sides and scratched along her backbone consoled her, but the fact was she wanted a job to do. By then she'd been in the house for almost a year, away from her litter mates, away from the sounds and smells of the kennel, with only the daily training work to occupy her. Now even that had become routine, and she was not the kind of dog who could be idle for long without growing unhappy. If they didn't know about this thing, it was all that much more important that she find it and show them. In April, she began to wake in the night and wander the house, pausing beside the vacant couch and the blowing furnace registers to ask what they knew but they never answered, or knew but couldn't say. Always, at the end of those moonlight prowls, she found herself standing in the room with the crib, where, at odd moments, she might discover Trudy rearranging the chest of drawers, or brushing her hand through the mobile suspended over it. From the doorway, her gaze was drawn to the rocking chair, bathed in the pale night light that filtered through the curtained window. She recalled a time when she'd slept beside that chair while Trudy rocked in the dark. She approached and dropped her nose below the seat and lifted it an inch, encouraging it to remember and tell her what more it knew, but it only tilted back and forth in silence. It was clear that the bed positively knew the secret, but it wasn't saying no matter how many times she asked. Edgar's parents awoke one night to find her dragging away the blanket in a moment of spite. In the morning, she poked her nose at the truck, the traveler, as she thought of it, sitting petrified in the driveway. But it, too, kept all secrets close and made no reply. And so, near the end of that time, she could only commiserate with Trudy, 
who now obviously longed to find the thing as much as Almondine, and who had, for some reason, begun to spend her time lying in bed instead of going to the kennel. The idea, it seemed, was to stop hunting for the thing entirely and let the house yield up its secret on its own. There came a morning when they woke, while it was still dark outside, and Gar began to rush around the house, stopping only long enough to make two quick phone calls. He threw some things into a suitcase and carried it out to the truck and then carried it back in again and threw some more things inside. And all the while he did this, Almondine watched Trudy dress slowly and deliberately. When she finished, she sat on the edge of the bed and said, Relax, Gar, there's plenty of time. They walked down the steps together, and Almondine escorted the two of them to the truck. When Trudy was seated in the cab, Almondine circled back and waited for the tailgate to open. But instead, Gar led her to the kennel and opened the door to an empty run. She stood in the aisle and looked at him, incredulous. Go on, he said. She considered the temptation of the open door. Morning light poured in from behind Gar, casting his shadow along the dry, dusty cement floor and over her. But in the end, she let him take her collar and lead her into the pen, which was the best she could do. Then there was the sound of the truck starting and tires on gravel. Some of the dogs barked out of habit at the noise, but Almondine was too stunned to do anything but stand in the straw and wait for the truck to return and Gar to rush back inside to get her. When she finally lay down, it was so near the door that tufts of her fur pressed through the squares of wire. Dr. Papineau arrived that evening and dished out food and water and checked on the pups. The next morning, Edgar's father returned, but he hurried through the chores, leaving Almondine in the kennel run. That evening, it was Papineau again. When the night came on, she stood in the outer kennel run, listening to the spring peepers begin their cacophony and the bats flickering overhead. And she looked at the frozen oculus of the moon as it rose above the trees and cast its blue radiance across the field. It was just cool enough for her breath to light up. And for a long time, she stood there, panting, trying to imagine what it was that was happening. Some of the other dogs pressed through the doors of their runs and stood with her. The old stone silo loomed over them. After a while, she gave up and pushed back inside and curled into a corner and set her gaze on the motionless barn doors. Another day passed, then two more. In the morning, Almondine heard the sound of a truck pulling into the yard, followed by a car. When Trudy's voice reached her, Almondine put her paws on the pen door and joined in the barking for the first time since she had been out there. Gar came out to the barn and opened her pen. She whirled in the aisle, then bolted for the back porch steps and turned there and panted over her shoulder, waiting for him to catch up. Trudy sat in her chair in the living room, a white blanket in her arms. Dr. Papineau was on the couch, hat on his lap. Almondine approached, quivering with curiosity. She slid her muzzle carefully along Trudy's shoulder, stopping just inches from the blanket, and she narrowed her eyes and inhaled a dozen short breaths. Faint huffing sounds emanated from the fabric, and a delicate pink hand jerked out. Five fingers splayed and relaxed, and so managed to express a yawn. That would be the first time Almondine saw Edgar's hands. In a way, that would be the first time she ever saw him make a sign. That miniature hand was so moist and pink and interesting, the temptation was almost irresistible. She pressed her nose forward another fraction of an inch. No licks, Trudy whispered in her ear. Almondine began to wag her tail, slowly at first, then faster, as if something long held motionless inside her 
had gained momentum enough to break free. The swing of her tail rocked her chest and shoulders like a counterweight. She withdrew her muzzle from across Trudy's chest and licked at the air. And with that small joke, she lost all reserve, and she play bowed and woofed quietly. As a result, she was downstayed, but she didn't mind as long as she was in a place where she could watch. Dr. Papineau sat with them for an hour or so. Their talk sounded low and serious. Somehow, Almondine concluded that they were worried about the baby, that something wasn't right. And yet she could see that the baby was fine. He squirmed, he breathed, he slept. When Dr. Papineau excused himself, Edgar's father went out to the barn to do chores properly for the first time in four days. And his mother, exhausted, looked out the windows while the infant slept. It was mid-afternoon on a spring day, brilliant, green, and cool. The house hunched quietly around them all. And then, sitting upright in her chair, Edgar's mother fell asleep. Almondine lay on the floor and watched, puzzling over something. As soon as Gar had opened the kennel door, she'd been sure that the house was about to reveal its secret that now she would find the thing that was going to happen. When she'd seen the blanket and scented the baby, she'd thought maybe that was it. But it seemed to her now that wasn't right either. Whatever it was, it had to do with the baby, but it wasn't simply the fact of the baby. While Almondine pondered this, a sound reached her ears, a whispery rasp, barely audible even to her, at first, she couldn't make sense of it. The moment she'd walked into the room, she'd heard the breaths coming from the blanket, the ones that nearly matched his mother's breathing. And so it took her a moment to understand that in this new sound, she was hearing distress, to realize that this near silence was the sound of him wailing. She waited for the sound to stop, but it went on and on as quiet as the rustle of the new leaves on the apple trees. That was what the concern had been about, she realized. The baby had no voice. It couldn't make a sound. Almondine began to pant. She shifted her weight from one hip to the other, and as she looked on and saw his mother continue to sleep, she finally understood. The thing that was going to happen was that her time for training was over, and now, at last, she had a job to do. And so Almondine gathered her legs beneath her and broke her stay. She crossed the room and paused beside the chair, and she became, in that moment, and was ever after, a cautious dog. For suddenly it seemed important that she be right in this. And looking at the two of them there, one silently bawling, one slumped in graceful exhaustion, certainty unfolded in her the way morning light fills a north room. She drew her tongue along his mother's face just once, very deliberately, then stepped back. His mother startled awake. After a moment, she shifted the blanket and its contents and adjusted her blouse, and soon enough, the whispery sounds the baby had been making were replaced by other sounds Almondine recognized, these equally quiet but carrying no note of distress. Almondine walked back to where she had been stayed. All of this had happened in the space of a moment or two, and through the pads of her feet, she could feel how her body had warmed a place on the rug. She stood for a long time looking at the two of them, and she lay down and tucked her nose under the tip of her tail, and she slept. Thanks. There's a lot going on in that chapter, uh, and most of it is under the surface, which is right where it belongs. Uh, but I want to use that as a springboard to talk about a a uh, somewhat basic question about novels uh, in general. 
which is, uh, why are there so many words in them? <laughs> or uh, to put it another way, uh, why on earth do we bother to write uh, or read stories that are hundreds of pages long? Because the answer is not obvious. Uh, uh, believe me, actually, when you're writing one, the answer is really not obvious. <laughs> uh, short stories make a lot more sense. From a very practical point of view, we're all rushed for time. We all have short attention spans. Uh, short stories are more portable. They fit better into the cracks in our lives. And they omit all that needless detail that you're never going to remember. Uh, and they're often more beautiful than novels. They are chiseled gems rather than globs of mud. <laughs> and of course, on that spectrum, poems are even further along. Best words, best order. And they're filled with wisdom. And yet I, and many readers, love the novel above all literary forms, and at least in my case, above all art forms. So this is a mystery. Uh, maybe a minor mystery, admittedly, but a mystery. When I talk to writers, one of the few things I can say that I think might be of use is that if they are trying to write a novel, they should abandon the use of the word novel because the word novel has no uh, helpful meaning whatsoever. whatsoever. It means new, uh, which doesn't tell you much about something as complicated as a novel. And instead, I encourage them to use this phrase in all cases, an unnaturally long story, <laughs> because that's what a novel actually is. And if you're trying to make one of these things, it frames the problem correctly. Uh, to illustrate, a naturally long story goes like this. Boy, did something weird ever happen to me at work today. Have a beer, sit down, I'll tell you all about it. It'll take 20 minutes. An unnaturally long story starts more along the lines of, boy, did something weird happen to me at work today. Have a seat, sit down, I'll tell you all about it. It's going to take me 22 hours. <laughs> Generally speaking, you get to do that once with any given friend. And then they find reasons to stop hanging out with you. So uh, using this simple substitution, the problem of the novel becomes a lot clearer. And you'd say things like, have you read any good unnaturally long stories lately? <laughs> or, when I retire, I'm going to write that unnaturally long story I've always felt I had inside me. Or, hi, mom and dad, I'm changing my major from accounting to the study of unnaturally long stories <laughs> in 18th century France. <laughs> the point being that, uh, thinking about it this way, puts uh, the emphasis on the, uh, the problem of length, the thing that defines a novel. Uh, and it raises some questions, at least in my mind. Why should a story be that long? And what stops it from fragmenting into many little stories? And for that matter, why are they so popular? And at least part of the answer, for me at least, has to do with the function of a novel. And by this, I mean that a novel is a designed thing. And like any designed thing, it has an intended function, distinct from short stories or poems. The novel's main function, at least the way I think about it, is the novel's main function is to be a story that has to be woven into a reader's life over the course of days or weeks. This is what makes a novel such a unique art form. There's nothing like it. Nothing else is designed to be an experience for that length of time. A novel has to be in a very strange way, durable. It has to survive interruption that we don't ask of any other art form. Uh, you have to go be able to go to sleep in the middle of it many times. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that the hallmark of a novel's success is that it creates within readers a double life. The, there's the life that you live in your everyday world and the life that you live in the fictional world. You wake up in the morning concerned about whatever happens to worry you about your life. Your doctor's appointment, the fact that the car is making a funny noise, uh, you have a trip planned, whatever. But you're also thinking about what's going on in the novel. And this doubled life is not an accident or a side effect. It is the main effect of the novel. It is the whole point of all those words, all that detail. And one of the things that's magical about novels, from my point of view, is that as these doubled lives progress, elements from one side begin to chime against elements from the other side. 
so that after you read it in your current novel, whatever you happen to be reading, you become sensitized to something that you happen to have run across. Say the fact that the fenders on cars uh, used to rust out in the shape of coastlines. Uh, or uh, conversely, uh, a chance glimpse of something in your real life, let's say a homeless man and a dog that he's adopted, uh, changes what seems significant to you in the next passage of the novel you read. And pretty soon you begin to suspect, and correctly, that no one else could possibly be having the same experience that you're having, even if they have the same edition of the book, even if they're reading it at the same time. You may be both haunted by the story, but that haunting will inevitably differ in its details. And stories often turn on their details. And I think that this explains something that is a side effect of the novel, which is this mild sense of loneliness that a person feels when a novel is actually working. It has to do with the sense that no one will ever register the details of their life against the story the way you are or have, not even yourself five years from now. It can never be the same, not even for you. And in a very real way, I think that the, the measure of success of a novel, the most successful novel, is the one that leaves you most alone when you turn the last page, which sounds kind of grim, and I don't mean it that way. Um, I think it's actually wonderful. Um, but we don't, I think, think of it in those terms very often. Because it certainly is the case that the loneliness uh, is greatest at the end of a novel. By then, you're in a kind of private world that I think you can't explain to anyone. And I have heard people say in the past, um, there is no word for that sensation when you close a book and you have no one to talk to about it right then. Uh, and even if someone was there, you couldn't talk to them about it. Uh, I also think that this sense of loneliness explains the existence of book clubs, uh, which seem to me to be a kind of response to loneliness in uh, a, a society that's almost pathological about um, uh, being disconnected, although book clubs are a good thing, or at least benign, um, more benign than, let's say, Twitter <laughs> or Facebook. Um, Anyway, in any case, uh, none of this is a side effect. A novelist, I think, begins with the idea of this entwined experience, the double life, and works backwards. Or another way of saying it is if novels didn't exist as an art form and you wanted to achieve that effect, uh, you would end up inventing them. And that's a simple idea, I know, and probably obvious, but it would be hard to overestimate how important it is uh, as uh, in the writing process, certainly. So now I want to introduce one other idea, and then I'm going to read another passage from the book. And the second idea is actually connected, uh, and it has to do with how unnaturally long stories are built, uh, specifically how they're structured. And I think that this is, uh, this is widely misunderstood, and I include myself and my own struggle to write this book as the prime example. Uh, we were all taught at one point or another to uh, take apart books in terms of plot. An initial situation, a series of crises and resolutions that escalate leads to a climax followed by a denouement. And personally, I love a story with a lot of plot. And when I find myself in a novel lacking that, I also find myself setting it down and finding reasons not to pick it up again. So I'm not uh, by any means uh, against the idea of plot. But the paradox is that plot accounts for almost nothing in most novels, even the most intricately plotted novel. And you can see this most clearly by going into the bookstore uh, at any university and looking at spark notes or any of those, uh, any of those uh, pamphlets that are designed to abstract the plot out. You, can take a, you could take a novel like uh, The Count of Monte Cristo, Cristo, which is labyrinthine in its plot, and, and boil it down to 10 pages if that's all you care about. Uh, and uh, the converse is also true. You can open uh, almost any novel to a random point and start finding details that seem to have nothing to do with the plot. So aside from those five or ten pages that are actually the plot in a 500-page novel, let's say, what are the rest of the words doing? Are they packing peanuts? Uh, are they a way to pass the time? Uh, and, of course, the answer is no. And, and more importantly, I think the, the answer is that often those elements that are not plot-related turn out to be our favorite parts of the story. 
Uh, but to make sense of them and why they're there, you have to use a different structural metaphor for, for how an, a novel is put together. And I think that a more productive way to talk about a novel is the structure of a novel is as a braid. That is a set of strands, each of which may be something extremely simple, an, an idea or a word or an image or a sound or perhaps a, some kind of literary or cultural reference, anything at all that surfaces at some point in the novel and submerges and then surfaces again in another form. Something that repeats, pattern with, rec with uh, repetition, uh, repetition with variation, I'm sorry. And the, uh, the important thing here is that every strand is one of those things that the story returns to obsessively, and every novel has lots of them. And there are lots of words that get used for this, lit crit words, but I say strand because um, I think of it in terms of carpentry. When you're building one of these things, that's, that's the way you think about it. Sometimes those strands reinforce one another. Sometimes they act in opposition. But the main thing is that no single strand defines what the novel as a whole is about. The, what the novel as a whole is about is the cumulative result of how those are wound together. And that is why, uh, at least in my experience, why it's so hard to say what a novel is about. Because if you pick one strand, you're ignoring all those other strands um, and implying that it is about that one strand. So uh, what I mean to say here is that uh, this braided structure of a novel means that it's crude, but basically true to say that nothing of significance ever happens once in a novel. Okay? So in the same way that significant things tend not to happen once in our lives, people get trapped in cycles, making the same mistake over and over again, like marrying someone who resembles one of their parents too much or undercutting themselves just when they've reached the brink of success in one way or another. So, uh, so that was the second of two ideas. The first is the, the double life. The second is the idea of the novel as a braid. Uh, 